Thanks for the introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak here and to all of you for attending my talk. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, quantum algorithms for structure problems, and I know you've had a few different algorithms talks already this week. Um, this is going to be uh, on a kind of different topics. So the last, the last algorithms talk that you had was on things like uh, quantum algorithms for factoring and hidden subgroup and these kind of things. So in my talk, you're not going to see such impressive super polynomial speedups. Um, all of the, the, the quantum algorithms that I'm going to tell you about get at most a square root speed up. But these algorithms are very important because they're much more general. They don't solve just one problem like factoring. These algorithms can be applied in countless settings to get um, modest speedups for a, a large family of problems. So since a lot of you are interested in cryptography, uh, when you're thinking about using these for crypt analysis, they're not going to break any crypto system, but they might affect what your key sizes need to be. And uh, of course, please stop me if you have any questions throughout the talk. Uh, I don't want to lose anyone, um, so feel free to <coughs> do, slow things down. That's you know, no problem. <clears throat> so those, this lecture has three parts. In the first part of my talk, which will probably take the most time, I'm going to introduce Grover's algorithm, which is a quantum algorithm that solves a very general problem called unstructured search. And I'm going to actually describe how the algorithm works, and so we're going to talk about why it works. Um, and there's, uh, there's also extra detail. I should mention, if you haven't seen it already, there's a handout, um, which is sort of going along with this talk. You can kind of follow along in the handout, or you can just listen to me and look at the handout later. There's some details in the handout that I won't be, be covering in the talk, um, but then everything is like more or less structured like the talk. The second part of my talk, I will be um, describing a generalization of Grover's algorithm called amplitude amplification, and this is a very important framework that allows you to get very uh, generic speedups on uh, certain kinds of um, classical algorithms. And then finally. I'll be giving some applications to the problem of finding collisions and hash functions, and I'll in particular be showing you an optimal quantum algorithm for finding a collision in any hash function, which is due to bizarre fire and tap. And this will give some examples of how you can apply amplitude application. Okay, so let's just jump into the first part of my talk, which is on unstructured search and uh, Grover's algorithm. <coughs> So the problems that we're going to be talking about today are search problems, and search problems are a very, very general kind of problem. They have the structure shown here. So the input is some marked set, which is a subset of some universe omega. So omega is just any finite, finite set. Um, and we think, we imagine that we have m, m is specified by the input in some way, and we also imagine we have some function f sub m, which tells us if something is in M. So f sub m of x is 1 if and only if x is in M, and this is sort of how we tell if something is in M. And what we want to output is some x such that x is in M. So we want to find an element of the mark set. So let's look at some examples of problems that have a structure. So one example is a problem of inverting a permutation. So in this problem, you're given as input a permutation, sigma, so you can compute this permutation, maybe you have it as a list and you can query um, to the permutation, and what you want is you want to find uh, the unique x such that sigma of x equals 1, so that is sigma inverse of 1. And so of course it's easy to compute sigma, but that doesn't mean that you can compute the inverse, so this could generally be a difficult problem. So in this problem, the universe is just uh, the integers from 1 to n, and the mark set is just the unique element that uh, is mapped to 1 by sigma. Okay, and then another example of a search problem is finding a collision in a hash function. So um, if you have some hash function h, which takes integers from 1 to n to some perhaps much smaller uh, domain of size k, um, we want to find some pair xy of unique elements such that h of x is equal to h of y. <coughs> So our search space is all of the pairs of unique elements, and the marked set is just 
the, the set of such pairs x, y such that h of x equals h of y. So here, notice that the, um, the marked set has many things in it, so there's many possible valid outputs for this problem. And just to be very explicit, we can look at an example. So this is some possible hash function. It could be given to you as a table, or perhaps you have some efficient way of computing it. Um, and you can see that there's several collisions. So one valid output would be 2 and 6, because h of 2 equals h of 6 equals 21. And another valid output would be 5n, because h of 5 equals h of n. OK, um, another important example is satisfiability. So for satisfiability, the input is a Boolean formula, uh, phi, and you want to you want to output some string x uh, that satisfies phi. So that means that phi of x equals one. And so here, our uh, search space is just all n bit strings, and um, the marked set is all n bit strings that satisfy the formula phi. And so um, notice that any n p problem can be phrased as a search problem where we, are, we can just consider searching for a certificate. And then finally, another example is, um, is factoring. So in, in factoring, the input is some integer, and we want to output a non-trivial factor. And so we can just view this as, as a search for a non-trivial factor. OK. Um, so one way of looking at search problems is by completely forgetting about any structure of the problem, and we call this unstructured search or black box search. And in this problem, we imagine that someone has given us some, some oracle or some black box, and we can query it. Uh, we can give this box x, and it will give us f of x, where f is some arbitrary function. And we are looking for some x such that f of x equals 1. So this is, um, this is a very abstract problem, it's maybe not, it doesn't sound very useful in practice, but the important point is that if we can solve this problem, this gives a, solu a, a solution to any search problem. It might not be the best solution, um, so for instance, for factoring, um, you know from, uh, from um, the previous lecture on Shor's algorithm that simply searching for, um, searching for something that's is a, a non-trivial factor of an in, in, integer, and ignoring all of the structure, the structure of a problem is not the best thing, the best way to look at factoring. By, by looking at the structure of the factoring problem, you can get a much better algorithm. But for some problems, um, it, it, there's not much you can do except looking at the problem as a black box. So if you can come up with an algorithm for unstructured search, this algorithm applies to any search problem. And of course, we can also consider having some quantum black box. Um, we just want to make this black box reversible so that it's a, a unitary operation. And to make the black box reversible, we just suppose that the input has two parts. So some, some input x, which is you know, something in our domain, an integer from 1 to n, and some bit b. And then the output is x again, and the value f of x, x ordered into b. So this is, this is just a way of making this reversible. And then we can extend this by linearity and we can query this in superposition. And you can, you can see that if, if you have some efficient way of computing f, then of course you have some efficient way of implementing this reversible version of the oracle. OK, so how would we solve one of these unstructured search problems? Um, there's not much you can do except for the following guess and check algorithm. So you can sample some uniform x, and then you can check if f of x equals 1, and if so, you output x, and then you can repeat. So this is, if, if your problem really has no structure, then classically, it's not difficult to see that this is really the best that you can do. This is really the only thing you can do, is you can just try different values of x and, until you find one uh, that is marked, such that f of x equals 1. So for example, in the problem of inverting a permutation, um, the best thing you can do, in fact, is to sample a uniform x and check if sigma of x equals 1. And if so, it's the, it's the inverse of 1, of, it's sigma inverse of 1, and you output x. And um, every time you sample an x, it has probability of being the correct one. Uh, it has probably 1 over n of being the, the correct x. And so if you repeat this big O of n times, 
Um, then with high probability, you will at some point find the correct answer. Um, okay, and, and again, this is the best thing that you can do for inverting a permutation. Um, for some search problems, this is like, for, for instance, for, um, for factoring, this would be a, a really silly algorithm, but for inverting a permutation, this is the best that you can do with, um, with only a classical computer. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about Grover's search algorithm, which is the quantum, the quantum version of his guess and check algorithm. So it's, it's very similar to this, but it's a quantum algorithm and it um, has better complexity. So, um, for simplicity, we'll just assume that there is a unique marked element, M. But before I continue, since now I'm going to be getting into quantum stuff, I just want to make sure that everyone is kind of clear on this, this classical stuff so far. Are there any questions about uh, this really simple randomized algorithm? All right. Okay, so um, as, you, as you heard earlier in the week, a quantum operation is, um, you know, aside from measurement, is some kind of a, a unitary map. And in particular, the unitaries that we're going to be using in this algorithm are very simple. They're just reflections. And there's just two reflections that we're going to repeat in the algorithm. So uh, let me define those reflections now. The first I'm going to call the checking reflection. And it is just um, this unitary map where I is the identity. And um, this ket m bra m is the orthogonal projector onto the span of m. So remember, m is the state that we're looking for. Um, and it's it's not difficult to see that this has the this has the action defined here. So for any x, so if x is equal to m, um, it's going to reflect the state. It's going to put a minus in front. But if x is some other number not equal to m, it's just going to fix the state. And then we can extend this by linearity to uh, to a unitary, which is a reflection. Okay, so is this clear? So this checking operation is just going to kind of mark our marked state M by putting a minus sign in front of it. Okay, is it clear to everyone how this is defined? Okay, and then um, we'll define another reflection, which is the sort of the quantum analog of the, the, the sampling step of the guess and check algorithm. And it's also going to be a reflection. So it's just going to be uh, this reflection shown here. So, um, and, and again, the ket pi, bra pi is just the orthogonal projector into the state pi. And it's easy to see that the, the action of this is, um, where pi is this, is this state, which is the uniform superposition over the numbers from 1 to n. And this, this reflection acts as follows. So if you give it some state psi, um, if psi is equal to pi, it fixes the state. So this uh, reflection does nothing to pi. But if you give it something orthogonal to pi, it puts a minus in front of it. And then again, we can extend this by linearity. Okay, so our, we have these two reflections. The checking reflection is just going to put a minus in front of the marked state and fix everything orthogonal to the marked state. And the sampling reflection is just going to, uh, it's going to fix this, um, this vector pi, which is a uniform vector, a uniform superposition, and it's going to put a minus in front of everything orthogonal to pi. Yeah? Um, no, so I mean, these, um, uh, I've defined these in this particular way um, because these are going to be the building blocks for Grover's algorithm. And if I define the, like, these reflections are going to specifically make the algorithm work. So they're going to make the algorithm find a marked element and find it pretty quickly. But they are, they are um, really analogous to the, um, the two steps of the classical guess and check algorithm. Um, any other questions? Okay, so since the algorithm is going to consist of these two reflections, I need to tell you how to actually implement these reflections. So how would we actually implement these on a, on a quantum computer? 
So we start with the checking reflection. Um, so we have from the previous slide this query operation, so I'll just denote this by use of f, because this is a unitary operation. It just takes, again, um, some x and a bit b, and it, it just xors f of x into b. Okay, and then um, I'll show you how you can implement the reflection r sub m, the checking reflection. So it's implemented as follows. First, we apply use of f um, to a state x with an additional register that's just initialized to zero. So we, we're going to use an additional uh, ancillary space and initialize it to zero. And this is just going to put f of x in, in that um, ancillary register. Okay, makes sense so far? The next thing we're going to do is um, apply i tensor z, where z, um, I don't know if everyone can see this far to the bottom of the slide, but, uh, but z, I think you saw it earlier in the week, it's just a Pauli uh, operation. It just puts a minus one in front of one and, uh, and does nothing to zero. So um, this i tensor z is just going to be the identity on x, and it's going to act as z on f of x, which means it's going to put a phase of minus one conditioned on the value of f of x in front of the state. So we now have uh, minus one to the f of x in front of the state. And then finally we apply u sub f again, which is just going to xor f of x into itself, uh, resulting in a zero in the last register. Okay, so this, um, so this has had the effect of applying r sub m to the first register and uh, leaving the second register unchanged. So using a second ancillary register and set to zero, we can implement the reflection r sub m. Does that, is that clear? Or any questions? Yeah? Uh, yes, yes, it would work um, exactly the same. It only depends on the, the value f of x. It doesn't depend on, um, on x. So f of x will be 1 whenever x is marked, and in that case, we'll get a minus, a minus 1 in front. In fact, everything that I'm going to say is really going to apply to the case when there's multiple marked elements. I just, um, for simplicity, uh, I'm fixing the, the set of marked elements to be just 1. Okay, um, so is that clear so far? So this, this can be implemented, this reflection can be implemented as long as we can implement this unitary use of f. And this is kind of, a, this unitary is kind of a classical unitary. It's really just, um, you know, it's mapping computational basis states to computational basis states. It's really just a classical operation that we've extended by linearity. Okay, and, and, um, and this, the other thing that we have to do, this net gate, this is really a, a very trivial thing. Um, this is a, an elementary quantum gate. So we, this has really shown that as long as we can implement use of f, that is, we can compute the function f, um, we can also implement the reflection r sub m. Okay. Now let's talk about how we would implement the sampling reflection. It's actually kind of similar. Um, so we'll suppose we have some unitary u sub pi, excuse me, which, which maps uh, the, some, some zero state to the state pi. So this is saying that we have some way of starting in, you know, like a nothing state, we just usually initialize states to be zero. We have some way of constructing a uniform superposition um, over the numbers from one to n. And um, this, is, this is not a difficult thing to do, um, but generally, if pi was some more complicated state, this would just be saying we have some unitary that allows us to construct the state pi. Okay, so mapping zero to something is the same really as like, constructing that something. Um, and then I'm also going to suppose that r sub zero denotes a reflection around that zero state. Okay, so this reflection is just, it's similar to the reflection around pi, it's just going to fix zero, and it's going to put a minus in front of everything orthogonal to zero. So it's going to put a minus in front of every, everything else uh, and every other label. 
And then I claim that R sub pi is just um, uh, implemented as follows. Um, we're just going to um, apply first um, this u sub pi dagger. This is just the, the inverse of u sub pi. So we're going to kind of run u sub pi backwards, which we can always do with the unitary. So we can always, if we can do something forwards, we can always also do it backwards um, in quantum computing. Followed by r sub zero, and then finally we're going to run u sub pi forward. Okay, so let's see why this works. So first, suppose we apply this to pi. So since u sub pi maps zero to pi, if we run u sub pi backwards, it will map pi to zero. Okay, and then um, we're going to next apply r sub zero to zero, and r sub zero fixes zero. So, so that's how it defines. It does nothing to zero and puts a minus in front of everything orthogonal to zero. So um, we're left with u sub pi at pi to zero, which we know is um, is pi. Okay, so this map fixes pi, which is one of the things that we require. And suppose we apply it to something that is orthogonal to pi, which I'll just denote by um, by pi a perp. So this is just some arbitrary state that is orthogonal to pi. Okay, so since uh, um, pi perp is orthogonal to pi, uh, u sub pi dagger which maps <coughs> pi to zero, it must map pi perp to something orthogonal to zero. So I'll denote that something by zero perp. And since zero perp is orthogonal to zero, when we apply the reflection r zero, it's just going to put a minus in front of everything. And then uh, finally we apply u sub pi, which is going to map uh, zero perp back to pi perp. So it is how the effect of just putting a minus in front of pi perp. That's for any state pi perp that is orthogonal to pi. So this, this is showing us that as long as we have some way to compute the state pi, so as long as we have some way to start with um, the state initialized to zero and just map it to pi, we can implement the reflection of sub pi. And, um, and I, I want to kind of explain um, the intuition here. So pi is a uniform superposition, and this is, you should think of this as the quantum analog of a uniformly distributed uh, element from one to n. And so constructing the state pi is kind of like the quantum version of taking a uniform sample. And so that's why this, this reflection, r sub pi, is really the, the quantum analog of the sampling operation in the classical guess and check algorithm, because we can implement this reflection as long as we have a way of, of quantum sampling, uh, where quantum sampling is just constructing this uh, superposition, this uniform superposition. Okay, so I've shown you how to implement these two reflections, which I've defined, because the algorithm, Grover's algorithm, is just going to consist of these two reflections. So now I can actually show you Grover's algorithm. It's just this. Um, so maybe I'll make this a bit more explicit so we compare it to our guess and check algorithm. We're just going to start by initializing the state pi. And by initialize, what I really mean is, you know, mapping zero which is kind of, we always assume we start in state zero, mapping that to pi. But we have to somehow construct the state pi, which again is the uniform superposition. And then, um, again, this is sort of analogous to a classical sampling. And then we're going to repeat some number of times the following two steps. We're going to apply the reflection r sub m, which again is the, the quantum analog of checking. And then we're going to apply r sub pi, which again is, is also related to constructing the state pi, so it's, it's also a quantum analog of sampling. Okay, so this is really like we're going to, um, you know, sample and then check and then sample and then check, but we're doing sort of quantum versions of these operations. And then finally we're going to measure the state. Okay, so we'll end up in the state um, shown here. Okay, so this is um, this will be the state that we have at the beginning of step three because we've applied first r sub m and then r sub pi t times to the initial state pi, and then we're going to measure the state, and that will give us some number between one and n, m tilde, and then we'll check if f of m tilde is actually in fact equal to one, 
And if it is, we'll output M tilde, and that means we've succeeded, and otherwise we'll say that we failed. Okay, so I've described Ferber's algorithm to you, but you might be wondering, does this even work? What's the probability of measuring the unique marks M? Uh, is it even non-zero? Um, and I also haven't told you what T is, so presumably we need T to be sufficiently large for this to work. Um, I told you that this gets you at most a square root speed up, so T could certainly not be one and, and this still work. So how big does T need to be for this to work? Okay, so before I explain um, how and, and why this algorithm actually finds the marked state, as long as we have T sufficiently large, and before I tell you what sufficiently large means, are there any questions about the, the algorithm and how I presented it? So hopefully it's at least clear that um, you know this is an algorithm that you could implement. I told you how to implement the two reflections, and you're just going to repeat them over and over again. Okay. So now um, let's see. Let's analyze this algorithm and see uh, how it works. Okay. So um, let's define the state good to just be the, the unique mark state n. That's what we're actually looking for. So we're just going to call that state good. Okay? We want to measure good in the end, because if we measure good, yeah. And then I'm going to define bad to be the uniform superposition over all of the things we don't want. We don't want to measure something that's not equal to m, um, so we consider those bad states. So the, the state bad will be the uniform superposition over things that we don't want to measure. Okay? And we can actually forget about everything and just deal with good and bad. Um, we first notice that the, the state pi is just um, 1 over root n times good plus the square root of n minus 1 over n times bad. Okay, so pi is in the span of good and bad. Um, we can rewrite this as just uh, pi is equal to sine a good plus cos a bad. Uh, where sine of a is such that sine of a is equal to 1 over square root of n. Um, this is just the most general way of writing a quantum state with um, real amplitudes. <clears throat> okay, so um, the nice thing about Grover's algorithm, what makes it sort of easier to analyze, is that we're always going to stay in the span of good and bad. So we can really just consider this two-dimensional space, which is just the span of good and bad. And that's really nice because I can actually draw a two-dimensional space on my slides. <clears throat> so to start off, we are in the state pi, which is very close to bad. So it's, it's some small angle a away from bad. And what does that mean? That means if we were to measure pi with very large probability, we would measure something, we would not measure good. So good is the thing we want to measure, and bad is the superposition of things we don't want to measure. So if we were to measure pi, the probability that we would measure good would be very small, because you can see that pi is very small overlap with good. The projection on such is very small. <clears throat> so throughout the algorithm, what we want to do is we want to move our state closer to good. So now I'll show you how the algorithm actually does that. The first thing that we do um, after initializing pi is we do a reflection, the reflection r sub m. And this is going to put a minus in front of the marked element. So it's going to put a minus in front of the good component. In other words, it's going to reflect through this line bad. Okay? So that's what happens after the first application of r sub m. We move from pi to the state. You just reflect through that. And now, um, this has not increased our success probability at all, but the second thing that we're going to do is the reflection r sub pi, and that's a reflection through pi. So we're going to reflect through pi now, and then the result will be this state. Okay, so we were in this, um, we were in this gray state, before, and now we're in this red state. And notice that the red state 
is going to be an angle of 2 times a away from pi. So we've, we've increased the angle uh, between our current state and that by 2a. And in fact, every time we apply this pair of reflections, we'll move um, 2a angle closer to good. So the next thing we're going to do is, again, we're going to reflect through bad, and that results in this state. And then we're going to reflect through pi, and that results in this state. And again, we've increased our angle um, away from bad by 2a. OK, so um, we keep repeating this. And every time we do a pair of reflections, we're getting closer and closer to good until at some point we, are, uh, we have very high overlap with good. Okay, so finally, um, in this state, if we were to measure, we would, we would measure um, m with high probability, and that's what we want. So our entire goal is to move the, the state, um, our current state, closer <coughs> away from bad and towards good. And I'm, I'm kind of showing you that every time you apply the pair of reflections, r sub n followed by r sub pi, you move closer by 2a to, to good. Of course, if you keep doing this, you'll rotate too far and then you'll start getting away from good again. So we want to run this just the right number of times so that we stop when we're in a state like this one, which is close to good. Are there any questions? Yeah? What exactly do I need to know to calculate the optimal number of times I have to run this? If you want to calculate the optimal number of times, then you want to know the number of marked elements, or like the, the amount of amplitude on the marked set in the initial state. Um, but if you don't know that exactly, you can still get a good, um, there are still kind of classical techniques, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, so it's not necessary. If you, if you really want to calculate the, right, the, the optimal number of steps, then you do need to know this, but it's also not necessary for finding a marked element. You can still find a marked element with high probability without knowing, um, without knowing how many uh, marked elements there are. OK, uh, any other questions? Okay, so now the, the important thing we need to ask ourselves is um, um, what is, the, what is the, num the correct number of times to do this? So what is the correct value of t so that we get close to good? Um, so let's consider what that is. Um, okay, so... Um, so the, the size of the projection of pi onto good is sine of a, that's how we define a, which is just 1 over the square root of n. That's because um, there's a unique marked element. <coughs> is that clear? More or less? Okay, so if we zoom in on uh, this part of the, the picture, you can see that the arc length corresponding to the angle of a is at least 1 over root n. In fact, it's, it's approximately 1 over root n. This is just a sort of picture way of seeing a, a, a fact that is really important in the analysis of Grover's algorithm, which is just that for very small values a, uh, sine a is approximately equal to a. OK, so that means that um, at every step, I told you we're moving by an angle of 2a, which means we are moving at least an arc length of uh, 2 over root n. And um, the total arc distance that we want to cover is around pi over 2. I mean, we're, uh, we're not exactly starting in bad. We're starting a little bit away from bad. And we don't need to reach good perfectly. But we, we want to cover about pi over 2 um, in arc length to get from bad to good. OK? And, and, every, and every step, we move like 2 over 2. Right? We move an angle of 2a, which corresponds to an arc length of at least 2 over root n. So the number of steps that we want is um, pi over 4 times the square root of n. Um, okay, so this is, I mean, 
this is very important. I mean, the, the square root of n part, no one cares about the constant, but the square root of n part is, is very important because what I'm telling you is that you can find a unique marked element using square root of n steps. Whereas in the classical guess and check algorithm, if you want to find a unique marked element, then you'd have to query, you know, there are n possible elements that could be marked. You would have to query um, at least, say, n over 2 to have some kind of um, like probability, at least half, that you, that you found a marked element. So here I'm, I'm telling you that quantumly, you can do this in square root of n, whereas classically you would require n. So this is a, a very important um, result. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we can formally analyze this. So I tried to show you kind of in pictures why this works. Uh, so I told you, and I, I tried to show you that the, the product of these reflections, so r sub m followed by r sub pi, it moves the state towards good by an angle of 2a where again, a is just defined so that the sine of a is equal to 1 over square root of n. Um, so to make this more formal, we can define um, psi sub theta to just be uh, the state sine theta good plus cos theta bad. So this is just the state in this um, uh, two-dimensional subspace, the span of good and bad, where the angle between the state and bad is theta. So notice, for example, that pi is psi sub a. Okay, so the formal statement of this theorem is just we want to say that applying um, r sub m followed by r sub pi to any state psi theta <laughs> will result in the state psi theta plus 2a. So it's moving the angle, it's increasing the angle by 2a every time. And to, to show that, we'll, we just need to show two things. So um, the first is that our r sub m, this reflection, it just moves psi theta to psi minus theta. And then the second thing we want to show is that r sub pi moves psi theta to psi 2a minus theta. And then it should be clear that uh, um, the theorem we want, to, the first theorem we want to prove, follows from these two lemmas. Any questions at this point? Okay, so um, the first lemma is, is very easy to see. Um, so the reflection r sub m just reflects through bad, right? It's just putting a minus in front of the good component and fixing the bad component, which is the same as reflecting through bad. And so, of course, this is going to give us an angle of minus theta from, from bad. Uh, but we can also, of course, prove it also very easily using trigonometry. Um, so the, the reflection r sub m, what it does is it just puts a minus in front of good, and everything orthogonal to it, such as bad, it fixes. And then this gives us the result, just using the fact that sine of minus theta is minus sine of theta, and cos of minus theta is cos of theta. Okay? So this is, uh, this is very simple. Um, and then for the second lemma, um, to see this, so we want to show that r sub pi uh, applied to psi theta is going to give us psi, um, this should actually be minus theta plus 2a, there's a typo. Just minus theta, okay. Um, so we can also see this kind of graphically. So the reflection r pi is a reflection through pi, okay, so it just does this. Um, so it moves like the gray to the red. And so we can see that the total angle away from bad is going to be, there's a, um, the reason that we have this, this minus here is just because this theta here is necessarily a, a negative number, and up here uh, this is a, a positive number. So, um, so minus, so theta is a negative number, and minus theta is a positive number, and uh, we also have um, 2a contributed by, um, you know, the angle between bad and pi, which is a, and you know, an extra a because of reflecting through there. So it's very easy to see, sort of, graphically that this is true. Okay, so that the resulting state 
uh, here is psi um, to a minus theta. Um, and again, this can also be shown trigonometrically using just you know standard trig identities that you've seen. Um, this calculation is in the handout, and I'm not going to go through it. It's it's just tedious, but I mean it's uh, you can certainly follow it. So you can refer to the handout for details. Um, but this should at least show you kind of like graphically why this is true. So I hope you're convinced. Are there any questions? Um, all right, so this, this shows the theorem, uh, the first theorem that we wanted to prove, which is just that um, applying the reflection r sub m followed by the reflection r sub pi has the effect of increasing the angle away from that by 2a. And now what we can, like, that's sort of the, the meat of the analysis. Um, so now we can prove the following theorem. So if t is pi over 4 times the square root of n, or since t has to be an integer, you can take like, the ceiling of this, then Grover's algorithm has success probability at least 1 over 10. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to sketch a proof. You, if you want the constants and everything, that's also in the notes. Uh, okay. So first, we know from the, um, the first theorem that if we apply r sub n followed by r sub pi, t times, this will necessarily, uh, in, in our initial state, Call is pi, which is the same as psi sub a. Okay, we start at an angle of a away from that. And this will increase the angle by 2a t times. So it will increase the angle by 2, uh, 2 t a. Okay, so um, psi sub 2 t plus 1 times a is the same as uh, this state here. That's the definition of psi theta. And since our ultimate goal is to measure m, and uh, good is just m, we actually want to measure good. So the, uh, the amplitude that we're interested in is this sine of 2t plus 1a. So the probability that we measure m is just uh, the, the square of the sine of 2t plus 1a. Okay, the probability of the measurement is just the square of the amplitude. Okay, so that is the success probability. Um, if we measure m, then we're going to output m. We're going to check that f of m equals 1, and we're going to output m. If we don't measure m, if we measure anything else, then we're going to output fail. So the success probability is the, the square of the sine of 2t plus 1 times a. Okay, is that clear? Okay. Um, so that's, a, that's about the same as um, 1 minus 2t plus 1a minus pi over 2 squared. Um, this this is, can be derived from the fact that the sine of a is approximately equal to a when a is small, but I can also just show you in a graph these things are about true. So uh, this is the, just the, the, sine, the sine of x squared is the, the red line, and 1 minus x minus pi over 2 squared is the blue line, and you can see that they're basically the same. So um, now we just plug in t, which is pi over 4 times the square root of n. And um, finally, we'll, we'll notice that you know here, this is the thing that I've been saying, that when a is very small, sine of a is approximately equal to a. So this, in red, I have sine of a plotted, and in blue, I have a plotted. And you can see that they're basically the same, as long as it is close to 0. And so, um, so a is approximately equal to the sine of a, which is uh, 1 over square root of n. Okay, and so um, when you plug in a equals 1 over square root of n to, uh, to here, then this is going to vanish. And so we get that the success probability is approximately 1. And by approximately 1, I mean like 1 tenth, but that's, um, you know, close enough. And again, if you want to get all the constants and everything, you can see like a more formal analysis in the handout. Um, but this just shows you that you know, with, with sort of constant probability, Grover's algorithm, as I presented, will be successful. And if you want higher probability, you know, if you are not satisfied with success probability one tenth, and you want success probability you know, 99 over 100, then you can just run Grover's algorithm a hundred times or um, you know, some, some constant number of times, it's still going to have, like, the total complexity is still going to be big O squared n, 
but you can increase, you can sort of amplify the success probability to any constant that you like. So you can get, you know, as close to as close to one as you as you want within a constant um, in a big O squared event. Okay, so this this sort of success probability amplification is a very common technique. You can, since you can check if you have the correct output, you can just keep uh, repeating this, um, you know, some constant number of times, and um, uh, and check that you have the correct output. Are there any questions about this analysis or um, Grover's algorithm in general? Yeah. Uh, so this is a trade-off basically between the success probability and the time expenditure. You could abort earlier and have a small success probability, right? Yeah, that, that is true. Is this that? Can you somehow prove, or is it trivial to see that it's optimal trade-off? This value of may make sense to abort earlier and have a small success probability. Um, if you if you want to optimize with um, with constants and things like that. Um, and then um, you know you might get you 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 might want a different constant than uh, pi over four. In fact, I think you will want a different constant than pi over four. Um, but for asymptotically, this is this is definitely the best thing that you can do. Assuming that your goal is to have success probability, like constant success probability, if for some reason the task that you're trying to implement is to be correct with you know probability like. One over square root of n, or something like that. Then, then of course, by all means, you can stop earlier. Yeah. Um, so my data set may be around uh, one megabyte of this, and then how many is how many quantum bits do I need to run this algorithm? Okay, so I, I just remembered I'm supposed to be repeating the question. So uh, your question is, uh, if you your how many how many qubits do you need to run this? Yeah. Okay. So the, the number of qubits you need for this is, um, is pretty small because you just need to be able to encode an integer between 1 and n, so your, if your database is size n, then you just need log n uh, qubits to maybe like plus a constant. So that's, um, that's pretty small. Okay, any other questions before we leave this slide? Okay. Um, okay, so just to state more explicitly what we just showed, we showed that given any black box function f from uh, the integers 1 up to n to uh, 0, 1, um, where there's a unique marked n, then there exists a quantum algorithm that uses square root of n queries to f. Um, to output m with constant success probability, so say 99 over 100, but you could put any any constant below one that you want. <clears throat> okay, but um, you know this was sort of assuming that m is unique was for simplicity. Um, this is not necessary. We could have shown using the same kind of argument. Um, oh, first, I guess I'm showing an example. Okay, so. Uh, for example, in inverting a, a permutation, this is already an example of a, um, a search problem where there, there is a unique marked element that you're looking for. Um, you're looking for the unique x such that sigma of x equals 1. And so it, it, it follows um, that the quantum gray complexity of inverting a permutation is the square root of n. So you just use Grover search to find the unique x such that sigma of x equals 1. And the, the, the best you could do classical would be n. So this is a square root speed up over the best um, classical algorithm. Okay, um, but as I started saying, um, we don't need to assume that the marked element is unique. Um, we could have proven using you know, a, a virtually the same argument um, that given, uh, given any f, any black box f, where there are exactly k marked values, um, then we could we could use Grover's algorithm with t set to big O of the square root of n over k, and that would um, find us a marked element with constant probability. Okay, so it, it shouldn't be too surprising that if there are more marked elements, it's easier to find one. So the if we had done this analysis without assuming a unique marked element, then the the complexity, we would have required t to be big over 
the square root of n over k. Okay, so this is for the case where we know that there are exactly k uh, values that are marked. But we don't need to know um, that there are k values. So there's some, some different, there are some different sort of classical techniques that we can put on top of Broca's algorithm to deal with this. So one is that for any function, we don't know the number of marked elements, um, but um, we can we could run um, we could run something like the following. So we'll first assume that there are many marked elements. So say we'll assume that there are like n over two marked elements, and we'll run Grover's algorithm with t a constant. <coughs> and if that doesn't give us a marked element, we'll revise revise our guess. Um, downwards, and we'll say, okay, maybe there's only n over four marked elements, and we'll keep we'll keep decreasing our guess on the number of marked elements. That is, we'll keep increasing the number of times we run Grover's algorithm until we get up to square root of n, and then the the expected number of queries will be the square root of n over the number of marked elements. This is without us even needing to know the number of marked elements. Okay, so we're just gonna this the this algorithm is going to terminate. Um, the expected time that this algorithm terminates is going to depend on the number of marked elements, but we don't know that ahead of time. But we could also get unlucky and this algorithm could run forever. Or, you know, maybe we even stop after big O of square root of n, but um, e even if there are many marked elements, we might get unlucky every time and never find one. This happens with some sort of small probability. <coughs> um, another thing that we could do is if we know there are at least k marked elements, so for example, if we know there's at least one marked element, then um, we could uh, do the same kind of argument that I just said, but um, you know, stopping after square root of n over k queries. So we would first, um, I mean, there, there, are, there are different ways that you can do this, but we, we could, in fact, um, maybe, maybe even the simplest way is we could just guess some uh, random, some uniform random t between one and the square root of n over k, and you can you can actually show that that has probability has constant probability of finding a marked element as long as there are at least k marked elements. Okay, so uh, these are sort of some of the different things that we can do with Broca's algorithm, making it sort of more robust. Um, are there any other questions about Grover's algorithm? Okay, um, so um, I think actually maybe this is a good time to stop because um, after the break I'll be starting uh, something like a little bit different. Unless there are any more questions about Grover's algorithm and the analysis and the applications. Okay, then. My understanding that there are not other questions. Good, so maybe we start a little bit earlier after the break and thank you to the speaker.